Hello and welcome to episode 14, The Marxist Solution. This is Marxism Today, and I'm Red Wagner. Uh, Not long ago, I was invited to speak to some college students taking a class on economic, social, and political theory. The talk was on Marxism, uh, because Marxism has a lot to say about economic, social, and political theory. Uh, This wasn't the first time that I've spoken to college students about Marxism, but it got me thinking about um, all of the different things that I've talked about students with before. When I speak to students, and when I've done it in the past and when I did it this time, um, I don't get a lot of resistance about any of the critique of capitalism part. Uh, Students largely acknowledge that workers are exploited. They generally agree that capitalism isn't very good for a variety of reasons. Uh, What students are interested in is this question. What is the alternative? What would a Marxist economy look like? And that's a good question. Uh, As a Marxist, I I like to hear this question because it means people are open to change. It means they're looking for answers. Uh, Some people, of course, can ask these questions already believing that there is no alternative to capitalism. But most of the young people who speak up and ask me this question seem genuinely interested in uh, a potential solution. As if they're saying to me, yes, we, we agree that capitalism is horrible. Now let's fix it. What's, what's the answer? The first time students asked me this question, I, I was really excited and I began to delve into the information that I knew uh, about a possible post-capitalist organization of society. But after thinking about it and reviewing how that went, I I think I made the wrong call when I did that. Uh, So now when I answer that question, I give a a different answer. And that's the answer that I'm going to give you here today. So my first point is that we're not going to get a blueprint from Marx, especially. And you'll hear a lot of Marxists say this, that Marx didn't leave a blueprint. Um, Most of Marx's writing... Um, you may know, is about understanding him. Uh, He knew that something would come after it, just as something has come after every system before capitalism. Capitalism will come to an end too, and something will come after it. And and he made some guesses uh, and predictions about what it could be like, and those are very famous pieces, but they're, they're very small compared to the majority of his work, which is just about understanding capitalism. I, 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 to, to make this point a little stronger, I want to take a look at this here. Uh, what we have here is someone, Marx, um, who is in one era of history trying to predict what the next era of history will be like. So uh, a, a, a good example would be a, a monk in a monastery in medieval times predicting what capitalism will be like. Okay, they, that person could make some predictions, but just really won't know what it's like until we get there uh, to a large extent. Uh, another example would be an Egyptian slave trying to predict what feudalism will be like. It, it's just going to be very hard to make those kinds of predictions. Now, as far as those predictions go, Marx Marx didn't lay out a lot of uh, specific detail, and it would have been kind of silly for him to do that. But he set some guiding principles, which have been to a greater or lesser uh, to a greater or lesser extent incorporated into the views of many socialists around the world. So, one principle that he set would be workers' control of the means of production. Um, To a large extent, this simply means not capitalism, uh, but also sets a guiding principle for what it could be like in the future. So under capitalism, the means of production are privately owned by a capitalist, by a boss, by a board of directors. um, And this would this couldn't go on in if if we had something besides capitalism because this is so emblematic of capitalism this this isn't how things um have been done in other societies and it's 
it's very particular to capitalism. So something that moves beyond capitalism will have to really address this issue. So worker self-control. And this also means that uh, we're going to, in certain ways, attempt to get rid of this dichotomy between worker and boss and worker and CEO. Any of the, these other common words for capitalists, workers and capitalists, proletariats and capitalists, doesn't matter what you call them. The idea is that we'll break down the distinction between these two because this distinction uh, is what puts people into different groups that have different interests. And that creates some of the largest contradictions that we see in capitalism is uh, bosses, CEOs, capitalists doing things that are good for themselves but which aren't particularly good for the workers, which aren't particularly good for the environment, which aren't particularly good for society as a whole, um, for just even things like a, a simple example is advertising. Uh, a lot of advertising is made to make people f feel bad about themselves and then present the solution, which is to buy the product that'll make you feel better. But making people feel bad about themselves is, is, is not particularly socially useful it's it's this negative product uh but it makes logical sense for an individual capitalist to do this because it creates demand for your for your product and then you can expand and grow your business uh so that's that's a contradiction brought on by that distinction between the workers and the capitalists so we'd have to get rid of that distinction if we wanted to move forward Another f very famous guiding principle that Marx set was, was his famous quote, from each according to ability to each according to need. Um, but he, he doesn't really lay out much in, in how exactly this is going to be done. And of course, it sounds great from each according to ability. So everyone does what they can and to each according to need. Everyone gets what they should get or what they deserve or what they should have. Um, Especially with, with the productive level of society at this point, I mean, the, the word need there is almost quite silly because we'll surely produ be producing more than what we strictly need. Um, so maybe a better word would be to each according to, I don't know, what, what he or she deserves. Either way, the, this guiding principle, um, I, th I think what it's really trying to get at is just a sense of fairness. Uh, a sense that p people should um, get the things that they deserve, uh, that people should, um, you know, be able to live decent lives and uh, have a significant amount of leisure time, things like that. Um, that we should feel like we're in a civilized society that treats people well. So again, uh, Marx was really not that interested in laying out what would be the blueprint or what would be the even the guiding principles. He may have said some inadvertently or offhandedly as he was writing, but that wasn't his core. That wasn't his reason for writing. So if Marx isn't where we're going to turn to for that kind of answer, where will we turn? Where can we look? Um, and, and the answer is that there is work being done on this now, and Marxists are working on this kind of thing, or people influenced by Marx who may not even call themselves Marxist are working on this kind of thing. But we, um, but, I, but at this point, that's not something that I'm going to get into. Uh, and, and, and this is the reason why, but because before you can really benefit from most of that type of writing, most of that kind of scholarship, uh, you need to really understand Marx and Marxism. You have to understand the critique of capital because this kind of work basically makes that assumption. It uh, assumes that you already know why things are broken and how capitalism works. And it can't just be that 
capitalism is bad because it's unfair. It has to be a very strong understanding of exactly why it's unfair and what surplus value is and why these contradictions exist and exactly what are the contradictions. Where do they come from? Because if you don't stand, understand, if you don't understand why something is broken, if you don't understand why something is wrong, there's no guarantee that you can avoid that same problem in the future. There's, there's no way to know that this new system won't just end up mimicking the old one in the same way. It won't just be the same old thing with a brand new name. So if we really want to make a change, make a solution that will make things different, really produce a new mode of production, a whole new kind of society, then we need to make changes that get to the root, that really change the important things. And in order to do that, we really need to understand the critique of capitalism. Because if we need to change capitalism, first we need to understand what it is. Let's let's get into a particular example of how our understanding of capitalism can shape the the form of our critique and the form of how we present new ideas. So without a very strong understanding of capitalism, we all kind of know that people that work in sweatshops are exploited, that they're not treated fairly, that it's bad, they're paid very low. Um, and some of them have a hard time buying enough food to um, replenish themselves for the next day. That's easy, and we don't really need Marx to know that that's wrong. But in a related topic, if we understand the theory of exploitation, that according to Marx, when we look at and, and when we look at Marxism, we can see this that there's really no reason to ever hire a worker unless the value that worker produces is greater than the amount that worker is paid. If it's the same, then, then you're taking a risk by hiring that worker that you don't need to take. So with an understanding of capitalism, with that Marxist understanding, we can see that all workers are exploited. That that's the, the, the general situation of any worker under a capitalist society or in a capitalist society. So th this will these two different understandings will lead to two very different critiques. If we just see very low pay as unfair, then the answer might be simply to raise the minimum wage or you know, to abolish sweatshop, sweatshops but still have kind of normal working areas. And while these are improvements, they keep us within the same mode of production. They do not resolve the contradictions that we see. So with a clear understanding of how capitalism works, if we want to end exploitation, which we'd have to do to move beyond capitalism, then we can't just have our stance be all, you know, wages need to be higher because simply raising wages under capitalism um, won't change capitalism. In fact, we, we can see kind of two different outcomes. You can raise them but they're still underneath what the worker produces and capitalism can still function in that way. Or you could raise them high enough that they reach the value that the worker produces or go above that value, at which point the job needs to be eliminated. The, the corporation, the who, whoever's making the decisions at the high level will decide to eliminate those jobs because they're costing the company money. They're, they're, they cost more than the value they put in, so there's no reason to have them. So we can't simply have a stance of wages should be higher. We need an entirely new organization of the workplace. And that's just one example. That's just the issue of exploitation. So we know we have a lot of other issues when we talk about Marxism. We have alienation. We have underconsumption. We have the relation to nature. All of these different pieces. And each one of them is going to inform our critique so that we can understand at a deeper level what we need to do 
to move beyond capitalism. Each piece that we know more about, each piece that we can see how capitalism functions is going to give us better insight into what post-capitalism could look like and have to be like. For example, if we don't like the pollution capitalism creates, then we have to understand why capitalism creates pollution in the first place if we want to make a better system. If we hate how people are treated like objects in capitalism, then we need to understand why capitalism does that. Why does capitalism compel us to treat other people as objects? If we want to end unemployment so that everyone that wants a job can have one, well, then we need to understand why there is unemployment. If we want to see, if we want to have more fulfilling work, work that makes us feel like a human being and makes us feel good about ourselves and like we're challenged, then we need to understand how that works under capitalism. If we want an end to war, if we want to see any of these things change, then we need to see how they are tied into our economic system, how they connect up with capitalism and how that needs to change in order for us to create something different. So if you came to this podcast, if you looked up this episode, hoping to find a Marxist solution, then, uh, Sadly, you won't get a very strong one here. You won't get the blueprint again from me. But I will give you the kind of the first step to getting that blueprint, which is you have to really dig in. You have to study Marxism. You have to understand capitalism. And I, I can't give you one magical book that you need to read in order to have everything make sense. Um, myself, I've been studying Marxism for quite a while, some years now, and I, I feel like I'm just at the beginning. Uh, not to make that sound daunting, but there's just a lot of stuff out there and there's a lot to understand. And if, if we want to be serious about um, changing the world for the better, then, then we have to take the task, which is a big task, seriously. A final note um, about Marxist solutions. Have I read uh, about Marxist solutions? Yeah. Uh, but I know that without the reading that I had done before, that these texts wouldn't make much sense to me. They, I wouldn't have known why the author was saying this as opposed to that. And if I, I would have felt like the guy was just making up things off the top of his head. Because I had done all of the studying beforehand and all of the reading beforehand, I knew why certain propositions were being made, what contradictions they are looking to solve, and what other problems they might create. So, again, if, if you came to this podcast looking for the Marxist solution, my answer to you is to, again to look for a Marxist understanding first. Once you have a strong Marxist understanding, then make that next step and find that solution. Thanks for joining me. This has been episode 14, The Marxist Solution. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.